everyone. <laughs> My name is Nyla. I'm one of those social media influencers. You know the type. And yes, it is a real job. <laughs> but bear with me for a minute. I know that influencers have a little bit of a bad reputation. I'm going to share a little bit more about what I do, and hopefully I'll change your mind a little bit. So what exactly do I do in this real job? Let me show you. This is me working for Visit Dubai. This is me working for a fashion brand in Japan. Here, I spent five days in Finland with locals exploring their culture and discovering the incredible wilderness of Lapland. I work here as often as possible. Okay, I do this a lot. Like any job, there's far more to it than what you see on the surface. It's incredibly rewarding, but it does have its downsides. One major drawback is that people make assumptions about me without knowing the entire story. In fact, I mean, I, I don't think that's fair. However, I do it too. It's human nature. Have any of you made any assumptions about me? Why don't we formalize this in a thought experiment? Identify an assumption you made about me. Don't worry, I've heard them before. <laughs> Social media can be quite forthcoming. So go for it. Wealthy, privileged, adrenaline junkie, maybe. It's actually a platform that can come off as self-serving, so maybe egocentric. Don't hold back. Anything that springs to mind. Now identify assumption that people make about you, or an assumption that you make about yourself. Think about it. Have you ever thought you can or you can't do anything? All right, hold on to those two assumptions me and you, and we'll get back to them in a minute. And by the way, if anybody did actually assume that I was privileged, that's very interesting because privilege is actually the subtext of my talk today, but not in the way that people interpret it usually. And if anybody thought I was nervous, you're absolutely bang on. <laughs> anyway, I was invited here, and I want to be here to talk about living on the edge. And since people make assumptions, I'm assuming maybe some of you are thinking, who is she to talk about living on the edge? So I'm going to share a little bit more about me, and let's see if your assumptions were correct. I was born in 1991. If any of you guessed I was older, you can leave. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, you can stay. There's little me. <laughs> I was raised in Lebanon in a tiny, tiny town called Mina in Tripoli. I never lived in the same house for longer than nine months. My ultra-Orthodox father beat me, sometimes with physical objects. I lost 80% of my vision in this eye from one of his physical attacks. And sometimes with his words, I lost 100% of my vision of myself and my future as he brainwashed me into traumatic levels of self-loathing and worthlessness. Then he left. So that was good. In 2000, at the age of nine, my mother and I fled from missiles in Tripoli and sought refuge in Saudi Arabia. Now, you know things are getting exciting when two women think Saudi Arabia is their best option. At the age of 16, my mother gave me my US passport, the best thing I inherited from my father, and she said she could no longer support me and that I had to leave. So naturally, I would do what any of you do at that point. I googled, <laughs> where is the cheapest place to live in America? And based on the um, search results, I ended up booking a ticket to Houston, Texas. I slept on a couch of a Facebook friend, and I waited for my mom to call to see if I was OK. And I waited, and I waited. And that's when things started to go downhill. After 17 weeks of my mom not calling, I literally saw the point in nothing. I figured if I died right now, who would even care? Certainly not my mom or dad. Remember, I was just a 16-year-old kid. I could not have felt more abandoned. I had nothing positive to say. I didn't think I was worthy of living. I didn't even want to live anymore. But 24 hours later, a puppy came into my life, Lily. She was gifted to me by my housemates. 
I think they knew what they were doing. You see, for me, up until this point, I had felt so uncared for by others, and I also didn't have anything I myself was responsible for. Lily checked two boxes I didn't know existed the day before. That my roommates cared, and that I needed to start caring. I didn't want Lily to feel abandoned and neglected. I knew what that was like, and I wanted to avoid that. So I, I, uh, th I held on a little bit longer, and I started to change my thinking. Then finally, by the way, my mom did call. Uh, she asked me for money. Um, <laughs> it was that very moment, actually, that I realized I am truly blessed. I'm privileged. No, I'm serious. Hear me out. I don't see privilege as just a set of inherited immunities and advantages. I see it as the ability to prevail, the tools to survive. Mostly, we think that being born into money and high social status offers privilege, and sure, in many ways it does, in areas where money and social status have utility. However, I believe that we can be privileged in many other ways. People who traveled internationally as a child, for example, become multilingual out of necessity, linguistically privileged. Tim Burton, one of the most incredible filmmakers in the world, he identifies with Asperger's, and look how he uses his unique perception. Michael Phelps calmed his ADHD by swimming. And this is where we get to the heart of this talk. Those that experience adversity in life, that are forced to endure, develop out of necessity a unique set of coping skills that help them prevail. I call them privileges. I just call them that. I just take hardship and I slap a new label on it. How many of us here feel like our greatest accomplishments were made despite adversity and that success happened by overcoming your challenges? And how many of you feel like your greatest disappointments actually occurred despite favorable odds and high expectations? We've all experienced hurt in one way or another. No one is above hurt, and no one is beneath privilege. Privilege, adversity, can be a privilege for us all. It can be our fuel, and like any fuel, it needs a spark to ignite. Lily was my spark. She needed me to survive. Something that day, some voice inside told me that saving my life was my responsibility. I had no self-esteem. It was my responsibility to earn it. I had no self-worth, but it was my responsibility to nurture it. I had no desire to live, but it was my responsibility to stoke it. It was my responsibility to save my life. I was a blank canvas. I never pushed back on anything. I never put anyone in a box. There were no boundaries to my perception. I started reading, soaking up the world around me. And oh boy, did the universe start to get out of my way. <laughs> I started working at a hot dog stand, then a clothing store. I walked dogs. I was a waitress. I worked at a factory. I was a receptionist. Then I started writing. And through writing, I discovered blogging. And through blogging, I started traveling. And through traveling, I realized that I had rewired myself. I was on a mission. I wanted to crush every false narrative, every misinformed assumption. I could, any, any misinformed assumption I could find. The sky was the limit, or was even that a myth? When I jump out of a plane, it's not just my fear of heights that I'm defying. It's every cruel notion my father made about me not being capable or worthy or competent. That's why I do it. I just celebrated a thousand jumps, and I don't plan <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I don't plan to stop. And if, as a social media influencer, I can inspire more people to defy their misinformed assumptions, amen, I will do it. So let's go back to the assumptions you guys made about me earlier. Maybe you know me a little bit better now. What about the assumptions you guys made about yourself? 
Should we let those go too? What if your self-image is even half a percent as off track as mine was? What if you're trapped by limited mindsets, thinking that you don't have the power when actually you do? <sighs> Man, if only I could write a letter to little me. Remember her? Hi, baby. <laughs> If only I could give her some hope for when things felt bleak. You know what I would say? Baby, pick up the stones that cut your feet and put them in your pocket. One day you will skim them over calmer water. You'll watch them bounce and ripple and disappear. And when you run out of stones, you will wish you had more. Gather the ropes that bind you. They may burn you now, but tomorrow, They'll be the ropes that help you climb out of dark holes. Hold on to the words that beat and berate you. Spell them out loud and proud and use them to cast your own spells. Loud and proud, because you can't say worthless without saying worth first. Remember that. And thank the ones that hold you back, because just as the archer pulls back his arrow, so the arrow flies. So hold on there, baby. I know it hurts, and I'm sorry it does. It won't last forever. Try to think of them as privileges. Gifts do open tomorrow, and you will be okay. It's been a privilege, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.